Thank you. Please sit. Sit. Uh, before we welcome Her Excellency to the stage, I'd like to say a few words about her, uh, a very important person in the room. Uh, before Her Excellency's appointment as governor, she enjoyed a distinguished law career spanning 43 years, serving as a role model for women in law at both the state and national levels. She was a Queen's, now King's Council, in 1989, and in 1993, judge of the Federal Court of Australia, the first woman to sit exclusively in that court. In 1996, Her Excellency achieved the distinction of being the first woman appointed to the New South Wales Court of Appeal and subsequently the first woman to be its president. Her Excellency was made a companion of the Order of Australia in the Australia Day Honours List on the 26th of January 2020 for eminent service to the people of New South Wales, particularly through leadership roles in the judiciary and as a mentor of young women lawyers. Your Excellency, you're welcome to the lectern to open today's Royal Society of New South Wales and Learn to Butchery Gamarua, the An Babana Gamarada. We are here on Gadigal Nura, and I pay my respects to the traditional owners, past, present, and emerging. Good morning. I've actually said good day in the local language, and uh, to many uh, old friends here. I mean that, you know, sort of friends who I've known for some time, not so much old friends. And those, it would be wonderful to meet uh, those whom we haven't had the opportunity to do so yet. And may I also welcome all those who are with us online for this forum, the Learned Academies Forum, which is entitled Our 21st Century Brain. Quite an evocative topic. I'd be curious to know how our... 21st century brain is different from the one I had a <laughs> quarter of a decade ago. But in speaking of brain, we speak of course of that wonderful and mysterious organ that makes us the us, the I, the individual that we are, that architect of our intelligence and of our emotional world. Looking back, we can see how far we've come in understanding or at least theorising about the connection between the physicality of what we are as thinking beings. In mid-19th century, there was a woman called Lydia Folger. She came from Massachusetts. She was a doctor and she specialised particularly in women's health. In 1844, she married. In many ways, it might have been thought to have been a backward step. In saying that, I must point out that I don't describe to the latest theory of marriage, of which I read recently in a news article in The Australian. The byline for the article read, controversial feminist figure Clementine Ford has described marriage as built on the oppression of women and compared wives to slaves. I was reading this article to Dennis and he told me the genders were around the wrong way. <laughs> he wanted to mention this morning. <laughs> the reason why I say that for Lydia Folger, marriage was a backward step is because she married the phrenologist, Lorenzo Niles Fowler. And as the only the second graduate in medicine from an American university, which at the time was an outstanding feat in itself, she too became a phrenologist and lectured widely on that topic. She wrote what she hoped would be the seminal text on the subject. The text was called Familiar Lessons on Phrenology and that was published in 1847. In following down that path of what today is classified as pseudoscience, Lydia Folger 
became a prominent, became pro a prominent uh, a proponent of a theory of the brain that had been promoted in Europe by the German physician Franz Joseph Gall in the late 18th century. It had continued acceptance into the 20th century, despite being debunked, in part at least, at the beginning of the 19th century by the French physician Marie-Jean-Pierre Fleuron. The idea of any prominent relationship between the gut, oops, one should turn pages in order. Gall's theory rested on the premise that the brain contained different discrete organs within it, which were then related to discrete categories of personality and mind. The larger a big brain organ, as it were, the larger it was, the more dominant was the relevant category of personality in the brain's owner. The size of these brain organs, it was said, were discernible from a person's skull, as the bumps and the shapes on the skull outside of the skull formed early in life, when the bones were still soft and impressionable. I think that part, the bones being soft in the brain, is in, in the skull, is probably accurate still today. Some of Gaul's early research was conducted on the inmates of jails and asylums. Gaul contended that he could detect from the shape of their heads that a sufficient number of prisoners had criminal traits in common, such as murder, theft and the like. It's nothing like picking your subjects to prove your theory. But I do pause at this point to allow you to ponder in this eminent forum of big brains how your colleagues seated beside and around you might have fared should that scientific theory still adhere in the classification of mind and personality by the reference to the shape of all your different heads. It is unsurprisingly a discredited theory, but it was not until 2018 that an empirical 21st century evaluation of phrenology was undertaken. Using MRI scans to see if scalp bumps correlated with lifestyle and cognitive variables, this was mapped against Gaul's mental classifications, and it is said no evidence to support them was found. It's also not sure whether this was simply a Cambridge student's trick, but there you go. During the 19th century, there were other conceptions of the relationship between the physicality of the body and mental states that, like phrenology, might have been dismissed during the 20th century as quackery, but have, unlike phrenology, re-emerged recently in contemporary scientific discourse. In particular, I speak, and I gave it away before, of what has come to be known as the gut-brain axis. Those at the forefront of 19th century medical thought and practice took for granted that there existed a close connection between the gut and emotions. For instance, James Johnson, physician extraordinary to the royal family, wrote in 1827 that strange antipathies, disgusts, caprices of temper and eccentricities, which are considered solely as obliquities to the, of the intellect, have their source in corporeal disorder. And that corporeal disorder occurred in the stomach, or the gut, and specifically in the nerves surrounding it. That at least was the theory. The idea of any prominent relationship between the gut and the brain diminished somewhat during the 20th century, but it's been gaining significant traction again, at least since the 1990s, and is now well document, documented and indeed is rather a hot topic of research. Today, however, that theory, principle, is conceived as articulated not through the nerves surrounding the stomach, as had been assumed in the 19th century, but through the microbiome biome occurring in the gut. As recently as August this year, a paper was published by the researchers at the University of British Columbia's Faculty of Medicine that showed that levels of certain types of micro, microbiomes in, ba in babies' guts were associated with performance levels in certain tests of early cognitive development. The idea that the way our brains develop as infants, and therefore the way we might ultimately think, may be determined, at least to some extent it is said, by our gut flora, and that perhaps for some might be an unsettling thought. 
As one of the researchers involved in the study noted, when the possibility of making direct connections between specific bacteria and specific personality traits and cognitive development might be made, he said, and I'm not sure how much of, Professor, perhaps your scientific um, research and the wonders that you've come up with occurred in this way, but this researcher said, I woke up in a cold sweat one night and he thought, we're going to find IQ bugs. <laughs> now, it has, that hasn't come to pass as yet. The direct relationship between gut flora and the brain is undoubtedly far more complex than that sort of thought in the middle of the night. Nevertheless, to use a dreadful pun, it is food for thought. Perhaps an even more startling claim, that unsettled idea of this us, this individual formed by the brain, the person, uh, is one made in a book published last month by the eminent neuroendocrinologist Robert Sapolsky. In his book, Determined, Life Without Freedom, he argues that the moment we make what we might call a choice of free will, given the sequence of causal events leading up to that decision, there is in fact no space for free will to interpose itself. When asked where the genesis for his idea came from, Professor Sapolsky, in an interesting echo of the researcher I quoted earlier, said, I woke up at around two in the morning and thought, aha, I get it. There's no God, there's no purpose, and there's no free will. And it's been kind of like that ever since. But this forum's focus does give us a lot to think about, and I don't know how many of those sort of little brain snaps as opposed to synapses um, we're going to hear about. But I do offer the warmest thanks, as always, to the Royal Society and the Learned Academies for continuing this important tradition of facilitating informed and enlightening discourse and the opportunities for enrichment, both abstract and concrete, that these forums promote. I give special thanks to all the contributors to today's sessions. Your insights, considerations, research, generosity of spirit and thought in sharing your knowledge is inspirationally inspirational and it is priceless. I'm going to stay for bits and pieces during the course of the day. I fortunately can't stay for the entire day, I might add, not by the exercise of any free will on my part. I have a certain number of duties to attend to, but what I miss, I will certainly follow up with either on YouTube, but I actually like to read uh, what it is that you speak about these forums in your publication. So with that, it is my privilege to open the 2023 Royal Society of New South Wales and Learned Academies of Forum, Our 21st Century Brain. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. I always look forward to what you're going to say. Your own free will is exercised, as usual, in your opening remarks. Always very much on point. So, my name is Susan Pond, and I have the honour of being President of the Royal Society of New South Wales and Chair of the Forum Planning Committee. And I'm delighted to add my welcome to you here in the room and to the online audience to today's forum. We present the forum each year in partnership with five national learned academies, health and medical sciences, humanities, social sciences, science, and technology and engineering. These are the synergistic partnerships that catalyze extraordinary dialogue and creativity. We need both to generate breakthrough ideas to ensure that we have a better future. It's only by examining complex topics from the perspective of science and the humanities that we can make progress. I thank the academies and the Office of the New South Wales Chief Scientist and Engineer for their continued engagement with the society. First four and now five national academies have been in lockstep 
in staging the forum since 2015. I thank each of them for their sponsorship, which makes the live streaming and recording of today's proceedings possible. I thank House Holdings, led by a fellow of the Society, Mehdi Hassan, for its sponsorship this year. The videos ensure that we reach a much wider audience in real time and later via the Society's YouTube channel. I hope that we have a big audience across the state. I know that uh, some universities, including the University of New England, which I visited on Monday, have set aside three lecture theatres in its different campuses for people to gather and listen to the proceedings. I encourage everyone in the room and online to participate in the discussion using the hashtag 21st Century Brain and tagging the Royal Society and their respective academies and universities. I encourage those of you in the room to meet the 15 university students who are attending from across the state. They're going to be the ones that will take the actions and ideas we generate today well into the 21st century. The 21st century is bringing unprecedented challenges to humanity and the planet. They extend well beyond immediate threats to slow burning complex societal challenges such as global security, climate change, massive demographic shifts, resource limitations, information overload and artificial intelligence to name but a few. Today we're addressing two questions. Have we reached the edge of our human capacity to respond effectively to these challenges as individuals or groups? Or will our awesome brain power enable us to navigate our way through? My vote is for the latter. We can't answer these lofty questions in a day, but we can make a great start through our impressive lineup of speakers. They've been chosen carefully by the Forums Program Committee through its co-chairs, Professor Ian Hickey and Emeritus Professor Pip Patterson and representatives from each of the five academies. I take this opportunity because I won't get it at the end to thank all the members of the Program Committee for being so generous with their time and expertise. I also acknowledge and thank our webmaster, Lindsay Botton, who is responsible for all the AVIT, wrangling the final in-person guest list, posting information about the forum on the Society's website and in our bulletin, and so much more. I thank the Society's new communications officer, Amanda Yo, who's directing traffic on social media and to the media. Amanda is in the audience today. I thank Robert Marks, editor of the Society's Journal and Proceedings, who will be producing the enduring legacy to which Her Excellency referred in the form of written proceedings of the forum in the Journal of the Royal Society of New South Wales in June next year. Just imagine someone reading the journal in a hundred years' time and getting their head around uh, what we were thinking today. Finally, I thank Hans Costa, who's Secretary of the Planning Committee. To launch us into the discussion, I introduce George Paxnos AO. George is a distinguished fellow of the Society, member of the Program Committee representing the Australian Academy of Science as one of its fellows. He is Scientia Professor and NHMRC Principal Research Fellow at the University of New South Wales. His bio is extensive, too extensive to recount here, so I note a few highlights. He has identified 94 hitherto unknown regions in the brain of rats and humans and published 57 books on the brain and spinal cord in humans and experimental animals so far. His first book, The Rat Brain in Stereotaxic Coordinates, is the most cited work in neuroscience. His Atlas of the Human Brain received several awards. In 2023, he published a book 
a novel, A River Divided, about environmental issues, including the question of whether the brain is the right size for our survival. George, welcome to the stage. Governor, Dennis, uh, uh, Susan, uh, colleagues, uh, if I may quote Mark Twain, I always get embarrassed when they introduce me. They never say enough. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Governor, uh, you asked uh, 21st century brain. Did I change my brain from last century? Uh, I think the brain has not changed m much significantly in the last 100,000 years. But uh, as Susan said, the demands on it uh, have changed. Are we constructing a lot of mouse traps for ourselves? The brain is the only organ which uh, has a map of the outside world, a map of the body, and a map of our experience. In the next 15 minutes, I presume, yes. In the next 15 minutes, I will uh, mention uh, two recent uh, techniques of studying the brain anatomically. I will take you historically uh, through in research. And uh, uh, then I'll try to answer the question of whether the brain is in the Goldilocks zone, is the right size, will we manage? Uh, and uh, I have this. Okay. The ancient Egyptians discarded the brain in funerary practices and sent millennia of pharaohs brainless to their afterlife. Uh, the greatest hymn to the brain was sung by Hippocrates. Men ought to know that from the brain and from the brain only arise our pleasures, joys, laughters, jests, as well as our sorrows, pain, griefs, and tears. Unfortunately, Aristotle misjudged and thought that the brain was there to reduce the heat of the blood. Air conditioning. And, and you would know that the professor's greatness is measured by how long he managed to stymie progress in their field. And uh, uh, the adherents of Aristotle kept that thinking for over a thousand years. But there was opposition. Galen here uh, presented the encephalocentric view against the cardiocentric view of Aristotle. And the two battled each other out for 1,300 years until the dawn of modern science. And we see in the Merchant of Venice, Portia asks, Tell me, where is fancy bread, or in the heart, or in the head? And uh, if uh, you went today to Bondi Junction, or February 15th as I went, Valentine's Day, uh, the new Athens of the South, uh, where I actually uh, write my works uh, in the coffee there, uh, in uh, the... Uh, cognitively fertile crescent between Coles, Woolworth, and Target, uh, I was confronted, I thought, with pharaonic thinking. There were 300 Valentine's Day cards, all of them with at least one red heart on them, none of them with a brain. And I was forced to write a letter in the conversation. Darling, I love you from the bottom of my brain. And a lady journalist from Melbourne ABC called me. Are you insisting that the heart has nothing to do with love? I said, if in a heart transplant I get your heart, I am not going to fall in love with your husband. <laughs> she said, what a pity, and he's such a lovely man. After such a battle to localize the seat of the soul, psychology loses its soul in the 1930s. Uh, before giving a talk to uh, the clinical neuropsychologists in uh, Australia, I went to uh, the coffee room and uh, asked around, do you have a soul? And the 
question was always, always, pardon me? Eventually, a girl said to me, I did, until I started my PhD. Uh, according to Churchland, there is no ghost in the machine. Uh, the soul is surplus to requirements for scientific considerations. If the soul is where emotion and motivation reside, where mental activity occurs, sensations are perceived, memories are stored, love is constructed, reasoning takes place, and decisions are taken, then there is no need to hypothesize its existence. There is an organ that already performs these functions. More credit to the brain. The brain. Psychotherapeutic drugs act on whatever else ex except the soul. So psychology, soul is not required to understand behavior or modify it. Poor humans, do they at least have free will or is it just the brain? Is there free will? And uh, the governor mentioned uh, Robert Sapolsky, uh, one of uh, the most eloquent people in neuroscience. Uh, that uh, there is no freedom, no dignity. Uh, and uh, Skinner, of course, uh, said this a uh, long time ago. And as I was writing my talk in Board Junction again, I asked the lady who sat across of me, excuse me, do you, do you think, uh, do you have free will? She said, I do, but I'm not sure many out there have free will. And this is the paradox, that everybody thinks they have free will. But as to the others, mm, they are not that certain. Uh, and um, behavior, of course, according to psychologists, is uh, nature via nurture. There's no room for free will to elbow itself in the parade of genes, environment, genes, environment. And uh, in this way, the environment sculpts character, just as this unknown artist, perhaps Vidias, sculpted Apollo from Parian marble in this statue of the temple, at the temple of Zeus in Olympia. The environment sculpts behavior, just as Praxiteles sculpted Hermes. Poor humans, they have no soul, perhaps at least it's not required for anything that we know about. They have no free will. Again, credit to the brain. So, but is there any behavior where you can show that there's no freedom. Well, there is some evidence that in love, uh, there is no freedom. How many people who are deserted interfere with the person who deserted them? In their house, in the internet, in their work, they uh, hit her, they kill her, they commit suicide. If only they listened to neuroscience talks, they would understand that uh, much as uh, they cannot jettison love that torments them, uh, the person who abandoned them cannot make themselves love them. And uh, if you didn't believe me, at least please listen to what uh, Carmen says. You heard her. L'amour, il n'y a jamais, jamais connu de loi. Uh, this doesn't obey the law, uh, love. So, is it only the brain? Are we really slaves uh, of our brains? Slaves of yesterday? Or are we architects of our destiny? Uh, according to many neuroscientists, and of course, uh, it, could, it could be the case that the minority of neuroscientists who say otherwise are correct, who don't settle scores by voting in science, uh, they think that we are slaves of yesterday. But look what psychologists have discovered, that today is tomorrow's yesterday. And uh, they work today with people who have a problem, an obsession, whatever it is, and uh, assist them to make a different decision tomorrow under the same circumstances. Uh, and now, uh, something about this organ and how we study, at least anatomically. Uh, it used to be studied, as you can see to the uh, left, uh, with uh, nissel stains, the traditional stain. But there has been some progress uh, by using chemical stains, chemoarchitecture, using acetylcholinesterase, an enzyme. Look how much easier it is to find the organization of the brain by looking at the right. Uh, 
colored, the, color, the brown colored stain. And so this would we use to make atlases uh, of uh, rats, mice, uh, monkeys, birds, humans. Uh, and uh, somebody said, the gain in the brain is mainly in the stain. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but there's another player in the mix now, and this is uh, MRI, where we can actually uh, look also at the connectivity uh, of the brain, and you can uh, see here in different colors the direction of the different fibers in the brain. And uh, but of course, this is the rat, and uh, uh, we're far more interested in the human, though. Uh, as homologies go, it, the rat brain is a good facsimile of uh, the human brain in terms of areas. Uh, the monkey brain, of course, is far closer. There's actually structurally virtually nothing different. Uh, and uh, here we are constructing an atlas of uh, the human brain of the living person. This is a living uh, individual, one of my colleagues uh, from the University of Wollongong, Mark Shira. And uh, you can see in different colors, the different directions of the connections in the brain. And the connections, of course, could have different strength depending on what condition the brain is, if it is a pathological case or not. And you can see here uh, in um, the MRI uh, with facility what is happening there, where the connections are uh, going. So this is the other technique that I was going to mention to you. Uh, now then. Who is the uh, governor here in uh, the brain or the mind? Well, according to many neuroscientists, the mind has no agency. If only it could have one, can you imagine? Uh, we will virtually all have uh, an unwanted visit by dementia if we get to 100. Uh, if, it would be nice if we could direct our neurons to jettison the neurofibrillary tangles and plaques that uh, uh, the responsible for the disease. But no, the mind has no agency, according to many neuroscientists. And um, more credit to the brain, therefore. And I, hope, I hope I've convinced some of you of Hippocrates' notion of the primacy of the brain. If yes, it will be uh, that much more important to figure out if it is the right size. If the brain were smaller, less clever and capable of language than what it is, it would not have been able to produce the science and technology which they threaten existence. If the brain were larger than what it is, humans might have been able to comprehend the problem, even rectify it. The brain is not in the Goldilocks zone. It is not the right size. We are, and you might say, what is the problem you have to try to, to, try to solve? To try to solve the environmental issue. And uh, it's not. A small issue. I asked my eight-year-old uh, daughter, uh, "What said? What? Uh, tell me something you do today that doesn't pollute the planet." She said, "Running." I said, "That's good, but uh, if you run, you'll wear out more shoes." And uh, she said, "Running barefoot." I said, "That's good, but if you run, you build up your appetite, and they'll have to slaughter more chicken to feed you." Uh, then sitting on a chair. I said, that's good, but the, the, for, to, you, to make a chair, you have to cut a tree. Then lying on the ground naked. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's a problem with humans that we haven't understood who, who we are. The triple delusion, that we have a soul, that we have free will, and on the top of it, we are made in the image of uh, God. And uh, uh, this, uh, I try to explain to my granddaughter that uh, the ancients, uh, ancient gods were not fond of humans who compared themselves to them. And uh, uh, I said this king of Corinth uh, uh, was condemned to push a rock up the hill only for it to fall down again because he was narcissistic, egotistical, and insulting. She said, like Trump. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, uh, as, as you see the external similarity, with the, I didn't have a chimpanzee here to pose for me, uh, that is internally as well similar. In fact, we found no difference in the brainstem uh, of uh, the chimpanzee 
we studied when we compared it to the human and with the cortex and the rest of the brain of the rhesus monkey, even the marmoset, the areas are the same. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, in uh, whatever else we were made in the image of the divine, uh, in the brain were made in the image of the chimpanzee. Now, a chimpanzee brain is not easy to come by. I wrote to the Toronto Park Zoo to give me the opportunity to do a post-mortem once a chimpanzee died. They responded that they would be happy to oblige, but they hadn't had the death of a, zoo, of a chimpanzee in the zoo for a decade. Two months after receiving my letter, three chimpanzees died. Luckily, they didn't suspect me. <laughs> of course, Darwin said it uh, about human exceptionalism, how erroneous it is. Uh, and uh, and the, the, the problem we face is uh, the human hubris, that we haven't understood the limitations of uh, the human brain. Uh, and uh, uh, if we are to avoid constructing our own mouse traps, uh, then it will be good to appreciate uh, what we are capable of and what we are not. And uh, uh, you can see here Phaethon uh, sent down crashing to Earth by Zeus because he didn't do a good job uh, when he took the reins of uh, uh, the uh, uh, sun. And uh, uh, if only we could uh, uh, understand uh, this, uh, uh, what we faced, what, what our brain is, what the limitations are, then we might set our stern to the dawn and uh, not to the grave of our children and uh, make wings of our oars. And uh, uh, I've been thinking about this for the last 21 years, and I wrote a book uh, on it. If you, anybody would like to have an, a complimentary um, e-book or uh, a um, audio book, I'd be most pleased to send it to you. My email is there. Uh, and took me. Uh, just before submitting it, a friend saw me writing it again in Monday Junction, and she uh, asked me how it go, it's going. I said, well, 21 years, I'm not finished yet. She said, my cousin's novel was published posthumously. I said, you are giving me hope. Uh, and, uh, and then I tried to find a publisher and said, what does this deal with us? It deals with human cloning. It asks the question, what uh, would someone with the genetic endowment of Christ do if you were present today? Would you join Wall Street or street protests? Uh, it deals uh, with uh, uh, the Amazon. Uh, it's identical twins raised apart. Uh, and just uh, like different artists would sculpt different statues from the same block of marble, different environments produce different characters in the, even with the same DNA. And he said, and on wh what shelf would I place it? And until that point, I was convinced of uh, Woody Allen's dictum. If you are a bisexual, you double your chances of for a rendezvous on a Saturday night. Thank you. And and it's my to introduce to you a Professor Lucy Palmer, who is virtual uh, senior Medical Research Fellow at the Flory Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health at the University of Melbourne. After completing uh, a Master's of Science uh, at the University of Minnesota, PhD at the Australian National University, uh, Lucy Palmer pursued uh, her postdoctoral research at the University of Bern, Switzerland, and uh, Charité University in Germany before returning to Australia to establish uh, her research laboratory. Professor Palmer uses advanced imaging and uh, electrophysiological techniques uh, to investigate how the brain uh, encodes learning and memory. And uh, in health and disease, she has 35 peer-reviewed uh, articles in uh, uh, journals like Science and uh, Nature Communications, and um, uh, has given uh, 60 invited lectures, and has already received 20 uh, uh, prizes in the last uh, uh, decade. And uh, uh, 
there are many, as in the case of uh, many roads leading to Rome, there are many uh, roads that lead to neuroscience. In uh, Lucy Palmer's was uh, uh, through the nerve net of uh, the jellyfish. And um, I hope she will answer that question that pestered uh, Carl Lasley when he concluded that when he tried to find where memory is stored in the brain, that learning is just not possible. Lucy. Um, great. Well, uh, yeah, thank you for that uh, introduction and uh, lovely, lovely talk and uh, great honour to be here. And, uh, and um, it's, uh, it's wonderful that um, um, or this the brain, which is a, a great passion um, of mine, and, and as George said, I, I came to neuroscience in. It all just started with a lecture at university, uh, where I heard about jellyfish, um, and um, they're um, not quite brain, but somewhat uh, brain-like features. And um, yeah, I, I was um, uh, sucked into the, the world of, of neuroscience and trying to understand how how the brain works. Um, okay, so today um, I'll be talking about uh, kind of the mysteries of the brain, what makes up the brain and why it is so uh, mysterious. And even though we know a lot about the brain, we're really getting down to nitty gritty and George instrumental in our understanding of the connectivity of the brain. It's almost that, that, that case where the more that we know about the brain, we, the more that we realise we have to and um, any more questions are um, answer um, at the moment. So I'll keep us busy for a, a long time to come. Okay, so um, is an extremely complex um, biological organ. Uh, so Eric Kandel said the brain is a complex biological organ. I'll bring it closer. Um, the brain is a complex biological order, organ of great computational capability that constructs our sensory experiences, regulates our thoughts and emotions, and controls our actions. So you can see here on the, the picture of the brain that we've, uh, the different parts of the brain is all kind of controlling different aspects of, of what makes us who we are. I, I pointed to the top as I moved my hand because that's the part of the brain that's involved in controlling motion. Our visual system is right at the, the, end, at the back of the brain. Um, but this is what makes us uh, who we are. And actually, as you're um, listening to me talk and looking at the, the picture, you'll probably um, realise that your entire brain communicating um, all within itself in order for you to really understand what to say. So the brain in its whole is one complete um, large organ that has to bring together all the information from our sensory environment, our world around us. And if those bits of information don't, um, sorry, coming in and out, um, don't quite line up, then it's really distracting. You know when you watch those movies and something audio is just slightly out of the of what you see I personally then lose totally track of what's being said and it's really distracting so the, the brain does this on every every moment to moment and is such a, um, a fine-tuned um, structure that we're just starting to find out about okay and this all comes down to the to the almost the uh, interconnectivity of the brain. So the brain has to all uh, communicate uh, with, uh, with one another, either directly or, or indirectly. And we're just starting to, to kind of delve into the different functions of the brain and what parts of the brain um, all come together to, to create this holistic picture of the world that we live in. Okay, but understanding the brain um, and the fundamental um, aspects of the brain and, and how it works as a complete and complex organ is really vital for understanding what goes wrong in cases of, of disease. Um, so here are uh, diseases that, that are associated with uh, learning and memory, which is what my um, lab largely focuses on. But we focus on trying to understand the fundamental capabilities of the brain and how we form memories and how we, we learn things. And only by understanding, you know, the, the fundamentals of, of how the brain works can we really understand uh, or the mechanisms as to what goes wrong in cases of disease. 
Okay, so as George said, um, the brain comes in all shapes and sizes and it's actually quite a remarkable organ. Um, a lot of work is done on um, tiny brains, the mouse brain, and that's because they're a great model of the mammalian brain. Um, and, uh, and then the brain, of course, they've got a tiny, tiny little brain and it can go up in, uh, in its... Uh, in, in size as we go to, to humans and, and toothed whales. But something I think that is really remarkable about um, this graph here is you can see there's a linear correlation between the size of the brain and the size of the animal. So basically that, you know, bigger animals have bigger brains, smaller animals have smaller brains. So if we think of, you know, what, what makes us human, um, it's most probably not the literally the, the size of the brain that counts. It's probably... Um, what's within the brain and the communications that, that occur. Um, so um, something that's also really, um, uh, I find fascinating, is that the cortex, that's what some people refer to as the, the helmet of the brain, but that's the, the part of the brain that enables us to kind of make sense of our environment. And it's evolutionarily conserved. So if we look at our common ancestor, and if we just look at our primary senses, the visual sense, auditory sense, somatosensory sense, um, the, we all, all um, species um, are able to compute these um, these senses, but depending on our needs, we, we alter the amount of the brain that's kind of dictated to these regions. So if we focus on the auditory area, that's the yellow one in this uh, graph, in humans we don't really um, use our, um, our ears too, too well. We've got a uh, range of, of hearing compared to other animals. I'm personally half deaf, so I, I particularly have a, a smaller um, auditory uh, region in my brain. But if we look at things like the, the ghost bat, which is uh, to your right, I think, um, you can see that their auditory cortex has really expanded, and that's because they use echolocation in order to, to find the food for them to, to eat. So take home message here is that the, the brain is evolutionarily conserved, but it has a to the needs of each of the animals. Okay, so what, what is in... I, I think that the, the secret of the brain is actually what, is what makes up the brain. So the brain has 33 billion neurons. Um, so here's a picture of a human brain and all the, the coloured um, little blobs are different neurons and there's 33 billion of them in our brains. And so if we take out just one of these neurons, this is a cortical neurons, uh, cortical neurons from, a, from a human, and if you zone in on it and you can see the picture up the top, they have all these different um, projections which receive information from synaptically coupled other neurons. And this neuron here that, um, that you can see, it's called the cortical neuron, um, has 17,000 different um, inputs that can come onto this one single neuron and this is called the synapse. And this is where information is transferred between um, brain cells. So our brain has a thousand trillion synapses and when you think about the, um, the computational capability that the brain can then do, it's really um, immense. Okay, I won't, this is a lot of my work and I won't go into any detail, but the complexity doesn't just change with the morphology. It's also what different neurons do with this information that it receives. So neurons don't necessarily just receive one bit of information and then spit it out to the next neuron and the communication of the brain is something that's called an action potential, which is a 100 millivolt um, voltage uh, uh, signal. Um, but they're able to actually take information and actually make it... Um, larger than the sum of its parts. So the computational capability of the brain is not just in the sheer numbers of the neurons, but it's also in how the neurons take the information that they receive and transform it into something that is meaningful for us. Okay, and also the complexity doesn't stop with numbers, but they, neurons come in all shapes and sizes. And this is largely what we believe due to the... Um, um, basically the needs of each indi individual neuron according to the brain region that they're in and what information they receive and how they have to transform this information to cause an output. And if you ask me, the most beautiful um, uh, part of the brain is actually our cerebellum that has Purkinje cells that's associated with movement. But you can see here all the different shapes of neurons um, uh, from all different, from humans and also all different um, animal species is, is quite immense. So basically the brain is this immense organ that has so much uh, complexity and diversity within it that, that enables us to be who we are and enables um, animals to, to survive in this ever-changing environment. So 
So we know that neurons um, are the building blocks of behaviour, but in all honesty, we don't really know how they control behaviour. We don't really know why we are we, why we think the way we are, why we have free will. Um, and that's a, a large area of research that will uh, no doubt continue for, for, for a long time. Uh, so you might be asking, um, how do we record from the brain? Um, so George uh, showed some, some um, methods of recording from the entire brain and myself, as I was just saying, I, um, there's a lot of complexity within the brain with respect to these individual neurons. So my lab's interested in um, recording from uh, individual neurons to see how they compute information. And so a technique that essentially won a Nobel Prize um, by Bert Sackman and Erwin um, uh, Nair uh, back in 91 is called patch clamp electrophysiology and this is where we're able to record from individual neurons within an intact brain or, or outside of a brain. Uh, so um, here I normally would be pointing but there's a, something called a pipette and this is a really small thin slither of glass, one micron tip that we're able to go in and poke into a neuron and then we're able to uh, record the neural activity um, in response. So this here, are their action potentials that have been generated by putting input into neurons. And so we're able to look at individual neurons, see how they take this information and then how they transform it and, um, and look at what's important. Um, and so something that we do in my lab is that um, we do these electrical recordings from uh, mouse models, but also from, from human neurons. Um, a lot of research has been done, um, especially at the cellular level, looking at uh, mice and, and rodents, and they're, they're a wonderful um, study of the mammalian brain. Um, however, I must admit that writing to work one day, I did wonder, you know, how much of this is translatable into the human condition? I'm really interested in learning a memory, and we study the mice, and mice are amazing um, little critters, um, but is it reflective of how we learn and how we, um, how we form memories? So we um, now uh, receive human tissue from, um, from patients across the road at the Royal uh, Melbourne Hospital and then we're able to record from living uh, human tissue. And you'll be happy to hear, or maybe not, I'm not quite sure, but that the human brain, uh, or human neurons I should say, is really similar to, to, to the mouse brain. So we can record from a human neuron, record from a mouse neuron. If you showed me the traces of the, the electrical activity, I actually wouldn't be able to tell you which is mouse and which is human. And that's, I find, really quite remarkable because we are very different to mice. Um, the size does is different, of course, mouse neurons are slightly um, bigger. But there's only one cell type that is different between mice and, and humans, actually. Everything else is, is essentially the same. So I think it comes down to connectivity and numbers. Um, anyways, there's um, other, other modes of recording from individual neurons um, and uh, more so populations of neurons. And this is a technique that has been really revolutionised uh, neuroscience lately. Um, you, you record calcium um, within individual neurons. Calcium is a great proxy for activity within neurons. Uh, so you're able to, to put a calcium indicator into the brain and then we're able just to put a little window on the brain and then we can see how, um, how the brain is active, when it's active, and um, in, in particular what this means to, the, to certain types of, of uh, behaviour. So here you can see um, flashing lights and that is essentially a... A, um, a great way of uh, looking into when certain brain cells are active, how they're active, and uh, what essentially makes them tick. Okay, so um, as I said, that we uh, calcium imaging is a really powerful tool um, that uh, no doubt will also win a Nobel Prize at some point um, because we've learned a lot about the brain and its capabilities from uh, using this technique. Um, so you're able to hone in on an individual um, neuron and an individual input onto a neuron, these little spines, that uh, there's 17,000 of them. And then you can record um, the activity of this uh, particular um, brain region um, over time. So here you're, we're looking at this um, particular input pattern on day one. <coughs> And then uh, we, we typically look into how memories are formed and what have you. And then we can look at the, the activity pattern of this exact same neuron um, two weeks later. We can really see what changes in the brain and, and associate it to uh, what changes in, in the neuron, um, in the, the mouse behaviour. So something that in the last, I think I've got probably two minutes left or something, um, 
uh, is just a little bit about uh, more the nitty gritty of um, how the brain might change. So I've been talking about the complexity of the brain, but something that is absolutely remarkable about the brain is that it's really dynamic and it has to change its activity, its encoding of our environment according to the challenges that we receive um, day in, day out. So if we think about learning, um, and just say learning to, to ride a bike. So um, a quote from Albert Einstein, uh, which really rings true to me, is that learning is experience and everything else is just information. So if we're thinking about right, learning how to ride a bike, somebody, and I was just uh, teaching my daughter this the other day, so you know, I was telling her, okay, you've got the seat, you sit on the seat, you, you, know, you, you turn the, the pedals, the wheels will go around. That's great, you'll be off, you'll be riding. She's like, great, that's wonderful. She got on the seat. Uh, tried to put her feet up on the pedals and, and fell over straight away. So even though she had all of the information about how to, to ride a bike, she, she certainly couldn't ride a bike and I think it'll be a while before she does. But that's something that's actually really um, important is that just because you have the information about how something would work, you have to learn through, um, through experience. Um, so that's uh, something that's really important to look at in the brain and there's different um, levels of investigation. Uh, that you can do this. So as, as George was alluding to, you can look at the entire um, brain and how different parts of the brain are, are active. Um, something that my lab more so looks at is the individual neurons and how they change their activity as we learn how to do something or as we remember something. Um, something that I think is absolutely um, fascinating is that memory essentially defines us. It is who we are. Um, however, we don't really know how memories are formed. We know kind of where they're formed, but now we're starting to realise that they're, they're formed in more regions. Uh, so there's a lot for us to, to discover. But we do know that um, changes do occur in the brain. Um, and, um, and also importantly, they change, but they also have to you know, really adapt um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So how we can look at this is by um, training mice to, um, on, a, on a simple task. And then we're able to look at their brain activity um, on a day-to-day -day basis, basically, and then see how the different activity levels change throughout uh, learning. So in this case, we can train mice just to um, um, associate between two different um, auditory tones and it can take about three weeks and then we're able to, to look to see and correlate neural activity with the changes in the learning. Okay, and then I won't go into any detail whatsoever, but this just shows you the type of um, uh, data that we're able to record from the brain and, um, and we're able to look at it at the um, different times of learning. So as mice are passive and how they just essentially encode neural information um, and then as they're starting to learn. But I think that the take-home message is, normally I'd be pointing to it, but if we put all the stages of learning all up next to each other, you can see that this is just an, in, uh, an example of an individual neuron, and we see it at the population level too, that it's dynamic. So um, the different colours and the different graphs sometimes overlap and they're sometimes different. And that just sh shows that as, a, as the animal's learning and as we're learning things, the brain is changing. And in, in how neurons encode um, information is, is changing. Um, over time that is, that is absolutely crucial for, for this whole process. Okay. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that the brain is, it's really mysterious and it has to receive information from our sensory environment. All of this information all has to come in um, and that's fine. And I think that we've got a good handle on how, you know, our sensory world is encoded by the brain and how the brain actually um, receives all this information. But something that we really don't know is how this information is combined within the brain and, um, and how it changes from day to day. And, um, and, um, and this is a great area of, uh, of research um, that um, will probably be never ending um, and, and beyond me too. Okay, so with that, I definitely have to thank, um, this is my, my lab in, in Melbourne and if you're ever um, down in Melbourne, come and uh, <laughs> drop in and I uh, can talk about the brain and, and, uh, and how wonderful it is for, for a long time to, to come. So, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. And if I can quote the primary uh, school teacher of Napoleon, this student will go far. Uh, and uh, I would like to introduce the next speaker through video this time.
And uh, uh, then if we have time, we can have some questions if we allow it beyond uh, then. But we'll see. Uh, uh, Joshua Gordon is the director of uh, the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States. His MD, PhD degree at the University of California, San Francisco. He completed his psychiatry residence, a research fellowship at Columbia University. He joined the Columbia faculty in 2004 as an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry, where he conducted research, taught residents, and maintained a general psychiatric practice. In September 2016, he became the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Dr. Gordon's research focuses on the analysis of neural activity in mice carrying mutations of relevance to psychiatric diseases. His work has been recognized by several prestigious awards, including the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation NASA Young Investigator Award, the Rising Star Award from the International Mental Health Research Organization, the A.E. Bennett Research Award from the Society for Biological Psychiatry, the Daniel H. Efron Research Award from the American College of Neuropharmacology. Yes, please. The video. Hello, and thank you for welcoming me to the Royal Society of New South Wales' annual meeting. I'm Joshua Gordon, Director of the National Institute of Mental Health, which is one of the 27 institutes and centers that make up the U.S. National Institutes of Health, the largest biomedical research agency in the world. Our mission is to transform the understanding and treatment of mental illnesses through basic and clinical research paving the way for prevention, recovery, and cure. In order to achieve that mission, we support thousands of grants, contracts, and other research funding opportunities throughout the United States and indeed around the globe. This research over the past 75 years since the NIMH was founded has played a pivotal role in, under, in our understanding of the brain in developing groundbreaking treatments and therapies and improving the quality and availability of mental health care. NIMH-supported researchers have made tremendous progress in neuroscience, in translational medicine, and in improving healthcare systems, including in approaches to personalized medicine, which I want to focus on today. In order to improve mental health care, we need novel therapies and we need to understand how best to use the therapies mm. that we already have. NIMH research is building on findings from basic and applied science to develop and improve interventions for people with mental illnesses based on the premise that knowing more about our patients can help us treat them better. One major initiative is in rapidly acting treatments for treatment resistant depression or RAPID an NIMH-funded research project that supports the development of speedier therapies for severe treatment-resistant depression. RAPID aims to translate evidence into practical treatments by evaluating interventions with proof-of-concept trials and then following on that with randomized clinical studies. Study findings so far have suggested that standard and high doses of ketamine can rapidly produce antidepressant effects, but lower doses are ineffective. With this evidence, in 2019, FDA approved a relative of ketamine, esketamine, in the form of a nasal spray medication as an intervention for treatment-resistant depression. Today, NIMH-funded researchers are testing the safety, efficacy, and feasibility of therapies, including ketamine and esketamine, but also other modalities, such as transcranial magnetic stimulation, to rapidly reduce suicidal thoughts and behaviors in youth and adults. We continue to lead the research field in establishing effective neuromodulatory treatments for affective disorders via evidence-based clinical exploration. Specifically, we've conducted research to understand how best to use image-guided transcranial magnetic stimulation to provide, to provide more precision to our stimulation, which can allow for personalized stimulation in the future. Deep brain stimulation, another modality of, of, of treatment, also shows promise for treatment-resistant depression. And NIMH-funded research is examining how to use deep brain stimulation on a very personal basis by first recording the activity of individuals with anxiety and mood disorders, 
and then stimulating to reduce abnormal patterns of activity that have been identified in those particular individuals. Moving beyond depression and into other areas, NIMH has launched a broader precision psychiatry initiative that really aims to understand how best to apply the medications that we have now to the individuals who will best respond to them. As you know, treatment in psychiatry can be a hit or miss effort where the first treatment for someone may not work and they may need two or three or four clinic trials with medications or other therapies before they respond. This process for someone with depression or bipolar disorder or psychosis can last weeks or months, leaving individuals with the burden of their illnesses for extended periods of time. NIMH's Precision Psychiatry Initiative, especially the biomarker development piece of this, aims to reduce those waiting times and to improve care for individuals. In the biomarker space, NIMH is applying innovation, an innovation funnel approach to support stage-gated milestone-based projects to develop highly sensitive and specific biomarkers that can help physicians and their patients understand how best to intervene, what treatments that are available are most likely to uh, benefit each individual patient. This approach starts with a number of ideas, asks for pilot projects to prove their potential. And then a few of those ideas will move on to the second stage where they will be engaged in a prospective laboratory-based clinical trial with the eventual aim to support large phase three type clinical trials of biomarkers in community settings to show that they can improve outcomes in individuals when applied to their cases. Another project that we have is the Individually Measured Phenotypes to Advance Computational Translation in the Mental Health or IMPACT MH initiative. This initiative seeks to gather a large database of uh, uh, information on individuals with mental illness, including their clinical records, but also other information that may help us understand the course of their illness. This could include behavioral and physiological methods, digital data, et cetera. And then to apply machine learning and other techniques to understand how this data relate to those diagnoses and whether those data can improve our ability to make predictions about individual patients. These studies, the ones aimed at biomarker development and the one aimed at the larger constellation of manifestations of mental illness, are meant to improve our ability to treat patients and to improve outcomes by targeting therapies to their needs. Of course, the best therapies and approaches won't work if services aren't available for people and if those services don't use the evidence-based approaches that we've been developing. Therefore, NIMH supports research to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions, improve the quality and outcomes of care, enhance service delivery, and communicate and implement evidence-based treatments across a variety of care settings. In this vein, we're funding several projects to test strategies that increase the reach, efficacy, and quality, for example, of digital mental health interventions. A, a large project that seeks to use evidence-based approaches to improve care in the here and now is the Early Psychosis Intervention Network, or EPINET. This research initiative is aimed at enhancing effective coordinated specialty care delivery to people with symptoms of early psychosis. We funded eight regional scientific hubs that aim to study the fidelity, quality, and treatment effectiveness of coordinated specialty care in real world clinics distributed throughout the United States. These hubs will collect data on diagnosis, interventions, and outcomes in thousands of individuals with early psychosis and contribute that data to a national data coordinating center that will then feed the data back to those very same clinics so they can understand what is working for whom and where they need to make efforts to improve their care delivery. This project involves more than 100 community clinics in 17 states throughout the United States and really hopes to set a standard for how we can use data to provide continuous quality improvement for individuals with serious mental illness. I should mention, of course, the coordinated specialty care 
is a model of care delivery that's based upon work that's been done here in Australia for early intervention in psychosis. Another effort is our collection of advanced laboratories for the accelerating the reach and impact of treatments for youth and adults with mental illness, or Alacrity. The Alacrity Center's program supports the advancement of clinical research and practice by accelerating the translation of research findings and serving as incubators for innovative research ideas and new transdisciplinary collaborations. For example, one of our centers explores the intersection of behavioral economics and implementation science in the pursuit of improving mental health service delivery. Others, for example, look at, it, look at improving early detection of mental illness with digital measures in order to prevent adverse outcomes, particularly for youth and particularly in the United States for racial and ethnic minority youth. We have similar centers that are focused on suicide prevention. These practice-based suicide prevention centers are modeled after the Alacrity Center program, and they incorporate features intended to speed the translation of research into practice. This program is focused on developing, testing, and refining effective and scalable interventions at key in intercepts in the chain of care to reduce suicide deaths in the United States, a problem that has been increasing over the last 20 years. Hopefully you see from what I've talked about that NIMH research is doing a lot to try to help to develop novel therapies and to ensure that those evidence-based therapies are applied in real world settings. We feel that NIMH research is more important now than ever before Innovative research is needed to generate new knowledge, methods, and technologies that can be applied to, to, to achieve near-term improvement in mental health outcomes across diverse illnesses, disorders, age groups, backgrounds, and settings. Despite our scientific accomplishments, there is much more work that we need to do. And so it's my, been my pleasure to introduce NIMH to you today, and I hope that you have a wonderful meeting. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you for listening to us. Uh, Lucy and I will be available all day if anybody wants to ask us any questions. And I wish you one thing, that your brain shrinks less than expected for your age. Thank you.